Thank you everybody for joining in today for our breakthrough fireside chat series. No fireside, only pizza today. Um, I am Katrine Bagnar. I lead the mid enterprise sales team for AWS based in Sydney. Today, I have the honor to showcase some of the most inspiring Aussie innovation stories um, we have and we get to hear every day. But the goal of this webinar was actually to share it with the broader audience um, on how they continue to not just fuel the economy, build greater resilience, but actually redefine leadership. Um, we will hear what not just helped us survive 2020, but how do we accelerate into 2021 and 2022 moving forward. Um, the same culture and mindset um, that actually gets these businesses to stand out. And I think there's nobody on this call who doesn't know Domino's Pizza. And I think throughout COVID, they have become even more prominent, if not a lifeline to us all. Um, I want to welcome our amazing speakers, um, Nick Smith, Director of Customer Experience, Product and Design for ThoughtWorks Australia. I'll get him to uh, beatbox before he jumps in. And Michael Gillespie Group, Chief Digital Officer and Technology Officer for Domino's Pizza. I'll hand it over to Nick. Um, have fun, guys, and talk to you in a second. Uh, thanks for that, Katrin. Uh, and good to see you again, Michael. Uh, the three of us today are sort of joining uh, you from uh, Melbourne, Sydney, and Brisbane. So uh, another great example of, of how things have changed in the last 12 months uh, presenting an event like this. Michael, um, firstly, thanks for giving up your time today to, to chat to us. Um, I sort of, there's there's a probably a lot of the perceptions that people certainly in the industry would have about um, the role that digital has played in Domino's as a business over the past decade. Uh, and you've been there that whole time. I'd love to take it back to the start and sort of find out how that's played out for you inside that building. So what did, was there a, a particular moment that that triggered Domino's focus on uh, on creating that digital innovation capability? And then, you know, what was the starting point for that? Where were you at when you when you made that decision? Yeah, so um, Katrina and Nick, thank you for, you know, the intro and, and um, doing today's session with me um, and ThoughtWorks asking me to be part of this to share some of Domino's journey and um, hopefully depart some wisdom. And if not, I'm sure Katrina or Nick, you can add in <laughs> and add a bit more wisdom than I can sometimes. But for Domino's, you know, it, it seems crazy when you think a decade, it sounds a long time. And, and it's probably been about 13 or 14 years in reflection that we started this uh, sort of digital journey and, and you companies say digital transformation, whatever that is, it's, you know, it's table stakes these days that you need a digital component and a technology innovation component to your business. And however you inter interween that into your business is really down to the culture and the, and the, and the um, structure you have. But for Domino's at the time, we were, um, that's back to 2006. Um, you know, it's always been a business where, where I should just also give some insight. We're an Australian company. Uh, we own nine different Domino's markets. And through that, we pay obviously to back to a master um, franchisor being the Domino's US company to have the rights of those markets. And, and back that gave us sort of flexibility in the sense of, as long as there's certain things we stay aligned to, we can also go our own strategy. In 2006, we were we were going our um, own direction with what we thought we needed to do in a digital space. And we've always, through Domino's, the US company or Domino's Pizza um, Enterprises, the company I work for, we've always strived to how do we make things better for the customer from a product, from that be your traditional delivery or pickup experience through hopefully the quality of products we can offer at a great value to the customer, we saw the digital um, space as an opportunity to allow people to have more flexibility over their order and to, to be able to condense and provide experiences that weren't possible during or through traditional experiences of ordering in those days, which were picking up the phone or walking in store. And so, you know, that started to reel that it's that customer energy. What could we do with digital and anything we did with digital post that had to have the customer front of mind. How could this be better or beyond what could happen if you just picked up the phone? Because in 2006, for those who remember, um, it sounds like a long time ago, it wasn't that long ago, you ordered DVDs off Amazon, you might've ordered your air flights and you might've ordered some Ticketek. 
And still it was, yes, there was the 2000 D store boom and stuff, but yeah, at mass digital still wasn't there. And there was even retailers talking it down. So, but we knew if we were going to do it, we had to do it with a customer mindset. And we launched something called pizza tracker, which is universal now. And the real time tracking of any delivery is universal now. In those days, it was quite revolutionary. And that gave a reason to order online because you can never stay on a phone call for 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes while your order was being cooked and prepared and delivered. And the pizza tracker gave you transparency up until it left the store. Later, we actually provided the tracking of the driver. And the other thing that we were able to do, and, and people will always question, is this best practice? Why have you done this on your website? This is best practice. Best practice is within, I strongly believe, the company and the organization and the industry you're in. Take inspiration from outside, but validate if that idea will work for you. So we actually had Flash as our, and if people remember, when you still can use Flash sometimes, but you know, we chose Flash as a commercial solution because we could get it a very rich imagery experience. And we could also allow quite a visual way of editing a pizza. So we were at a two really clear points of differentiation. You could never edit, pizzas can be these days edited in the billions of different ways with bases and toppings over a phone. You couldn't ask for every topping you have, how, what are the rules and track it. So by just doing that, then set us the foundation of this customer led journey of only do things in digital and tech if it goes beyond what can be done in a normal or a traditional ordering environment. Bit of a bit of a bit, bit of a long story there, but hopefully that gave you the foundation of where we started and and it just sort of took off from then because that gravit customers gravitate. If you give customers a wow product or service beyond what they can get elsewhere, they're going to gravitate and use that as their um, main means of ordering. No, I think it's a it's a um... It's a pretty, it's a fascinating story, especially sort of when you think about the state that um, that online retail was in at, at that stage. Uh, it's it's a cool story to be able to talk about the channels that that opened up and what, what you were able to do in that channel space. But uh, all of us that have moved in that space are probably um, acutely aware of the pain that's involved in moving to something like that. So, uh, you know, what did you face? Because you mentioned there are about nine different markets. Um, that's, there's probably you know, an extraordinary hornet's nest of technology that sits behind making that work across those markets and untangling that over time. So um, what was it like to, to be able to bring that mindset, not just uh, customer focus on those channel side of things, but then to bring that back into the operations that support it? How far, how did you win that war? How did you sort of, sort of start to creep that back into the rest of the technology estate there? Yeah, it's, it's a good question, because if you think back, just to give the attendees um, some context of where we're at, where we sit, because sometimes, you know, there's a there's a belief that some people on the phone might know or on the call may know, but others may not. Um, we, we have around 2000, we have over 2700 stores across those nine markets. And of those stores, if you, if you, if you, if you think they're, they're vital distribution centers of getting pizza into the hands of our customers, hotter and fresher, and that, that means people's tolerance for delay of their pizza or any delivery is quite low. So, you know, we're ever growing our store count, but also that means it's, we have, we have an environment and I, and I saw one of our um, architects on here. We have an environment where, you know, we don't have the liberty of queuing orders. We don't have, and waiting till, till a service comes up. We, you know, it is real, real time. So if you're placing an order in some markets, we've actually over the space of a whole week delivered in three to four minutes from the order placed by the customer delivered to the door. And we're not pre-making pizzas and leaving them in a hot box, but that's through um, visibility we can get through machine learning and our ovens are only, and which AWS are a great partner of. And I know Katrina, you mentioned Danny before was, and um, Max Kelson and our Brisbane company were great helpers in visual, helping us bring that to life. But um, for us now, our digital system where back in 2006 was a handful of orders a day to the point I remember Don, or, or Alan, who was a CMO at the time, chasing me on why we were a couple of orders off in a day. Um, you know, it's last, our first half year, we did 1.42 billion. Um, and that was 25.4% up in the half year, the six months. We obviously don't have full year numbers to share. And over 70% now of our business over those nine markets. And that journey, as you said, how do you create from Brisbane, which we're based in a proud Australian company, how do you create a digital platform that can resonate and expand out to nine different markets in a retail environment on a QSR retail budget. And, you know, it, it is, it's not something we set out, I think from day one in memory, we set out and we started our digital journey. And then we realized we just started absorbing markets overseas. And, 
and we saw that our faith and thankfully the faith that gave me a job and kept me in a job to, to drive digital and the cust and that customer focus was giving us some pretty steady growth and we could see what our conversion numbers were and how the markets we absorb were tracking from not just digital in those days but best practice in even getting our email our other forms of communication um, testing all those things going our, our online advertising approach we thought we can't as a business work in silos we can't have one country have a completely discrepant online system to the other because ultimately what we're going to get is dual investment and not sharing and not and then when you as anyone knows if you can combine investment and have one platform to to do that on the economies of scale is just it self fulfills and that prepared us for many things in the future so it was it was a gradual journey and then you know i was just you know remember jumping on planes going to europe understanding their situation um working with the it team at the time on the challenges of how do we convert these countries over to our platform being empathetic to the the situation how other countries were because they were adopting a platform from the parent company and then using data and help prove where we're lifting conversion what we need to allow localized first global and that that you know not not the most simple journey but i think we did it pretty rapidly and and to have nine markets on one platform now we're very proud of and yeah it just gives us you know great we when we build something or release something we can share it with nine markets we're not then having to reproduce only using designs, we're actually got a similar common back end. Uh, that's that's um, that's pretty interesting. Uh, another part that you sort of touched on there a little bit. I think there's there's an interesting call. People that work a lot in this space, a lot of people have worked in digital products, especially in retail environments, into what you'd sort of think of as traditional businesses, not just digital native environments. Hmm. Would be used to, you know, doing a lot of that technology to support channels. So I think a lot of us would have had, um, you can do whatever you like in terms of pushing this out through online channels to our customers. But as soon as it creeps back into stores, as soon as it creeps back into product, then that's where the friction comes in. And I remember talking to um, a client of ours in Europe a couple of years ago, telling them the domino story. And you know, the first half of that was lots of cool stuff that happened in channels. And then they started to know, they, they sort of raised it with me. They're like, well, what we're starting to see here is the digital technology is playing a role in the product. And that's sort of making its way into stores. So you talk about a store network as big as that um, and a, a product that's on such a simple business model with so little margin for error as, as you know, uh, as, as quick service retail, and, uh, quick service restaurants and as um, pizzas are. How did you sort of get that out there? How did you deal with sort of getting digital into the different parts of the business like that? Well, I guess some of, some of it becomes self-fulfilling in a sense, because it's just like, as we started the journey with digital to the customer, with that customer vision of if, if we're doing this and we're gonna expand it and we're gonna to continue to grow it, it has to provide value back to the customer that goes beyond anything they're aware of or solve for customer needs um, and wants. So as the digital journey grew and as we started to um, globalize our, what we call one digital, our online system, Digital starts to become a, a larger component of the business, you know, at 70%. And, you know, um, even when we went to the mobile space in 2009, um, you know, we, we always showed that we went iPhone, um, one of the first in the world from a um, retail and a, and a QSR to release in 2009 an app and very proud of that success that it had at launch. But a lot of people told us to go mobile web. Why are you going out? Hardly anyone's got it. Well, we were going to provide a really poor ordering experience on mobile web in those days, if anyone remembers mobile webs in 2009. And, and that doesn't do anything for our product. And, and as much as it feels great when people call us a technology company, we are a pizza company. And if our core product's not right, it doesn't matter if the tech works. People will order a few once and they're not coming back because the pizza is the thing they're here for. We need to use tech to be almost that conduit of allowing the customer what to do, be as frictionless in the purchase where it's needed, and just get them that pizza. So we chose iPhone because it was visual. We could, in, we could really make, we could take it to even a whole new level beyond what we were doing even on our website, on, on the desktop web. Or, and then we made a reactive mobile site when HTML5 and, and phones were more aligned. But also who had the data at the time were the iPhone users. So as we started to do these things and as digital grew, the support of digital and tech throughout the business started to become 
almost a, a request or, or opportunities came available. So areas like prototyping and allowing our markets and marketing teams to validate product demand, where in the old days, you'd have to order a whole lot of product and pop it into one market. If it didn't work, you're stuck with the product. You know, do, doing things that technology allows through, and those who know about prototyping can read Alberto's story because that would take a long time to talk about, but being inspired by those and then using digital to open up that ability for marketers. And also, um, you know, at the time, you know, that allowing even the editing of products or the availability of seeing and making available to our customers, see what other services and products we offer. That meant that new, when we launched things like vegan cheese and gluten-free bases, the awareness of that was almost instant because of the velocity to the number of people we had online. And then what you have is then hopefully a framework of customer focus and fairly rapid delivery and building MVP that then you have other areas of the business at a store level or back house, back office, start to say, can we take some of those learnings or can we depart some of those learnings or technology in their space? And if you look at the last three or four years, we've even since GPS driver tracker, we've put a lot of energy as well, not into the customer experience at the end customer, the retail, but how do we improve the products and services behind the scenes? How do we democratize data with better dashboards? How do we provide services that utilize machine learning and help with better demand expectations at a store level? How do we automate rosters where we can to eliminate wastage? So you start seeing it get proliferated throughout the business, but the ethos is, or the focus is still the same. If we build something, it has to be usable and it has to have a customer vision at heart because you can give the best tools to people or you can try to impart, here's a great digital widget that does something, but if it's hard to use or doesn't meet the end purpose of the end user, unfortunately, um, you're going to lose the faith of, your, um, of, of the business pretty quickly and we're not going to get the value out of it. So that yeah. sort of the journey of that, it, it becomes almost, for us, it has become more self-fulfilling and we have never had a rivalry of if a customer wants to order over the phone or the internet, we, I, you know, I've seen businesses heard in the early days and I'm still now of people, you know, even internal friction over who gets the sale. For us, it's about enriching and helping our franchisees have the best mechanics get the best sales possible, how that comes through. Of course, we'd like digital because it's a better environment for the customer. But if someone still wants to walk in, we're not going to, pen up, we, you know, we, we're still going to give a great experience to them. And when we're not going to force them there, we'll bring them there with the products and services that we do. Yeah. Well, that sort of brings us to, and um, in the last couple of minutes here, I think it's, this is the, the interesting story to pull out from the last 12 months is, you know, uh, the global pandemic has had a, you know, horrendous impact on a lot of um, industries and a lot of people, and it's continuing to do so. I know we've got people on the call from India, and it's still, um, you know, a horrible situation over there. And that would have created a, a fascinating, I think a lot of us from the outside would have a perspective on what that meant for Domino's Pizza. So every business is aware of what role they think they play in their customers' lives, and um, some know it better than others. You would have had a fair idea of what job you, you know, did for your customers. Uh, Suddenly, your your role in 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 customers' um, lives is elevated in a moment like that. Uh, but mm -hmm. then you're also going through disruption of your own supply chains. and disrupted restaurants are probably closing. Um, how did the the foundations you laid in the years before that help you to adapt to the circumstance you found yourself in? There's not a lot of time to sort of um, build, measure, learn in a situation like that. No, there wasn't. And I think you know it's probably been remiss of me not to mention. I, t I talk a lot about from a Domino's perspective, but, and, and our customer focus and to, to achieve the growth we've had and to get into nine markets and achieve some of the world and market first, or even to build some of the solutions that some people thought impossible. Um, we've always prided us, and there's a great example of ThoughtWorks, we've always prided ourselves on knowing that we don't know everything and to, if we can vision, and we're not sure how to build a partner with the right partner to bring it to life or partner with people to bring ideas to us. And, and you combine all that and you enter such a horrible um, situation for the world with a global pandemic that no one could have ever predicted. Um, or people had one day it might happen, but you know, it, it just caught everyone. We as a company, hopefully people are getting on this call. We're very focused on the customer, but also focused on our staff as well and and safety has to be paramount as a delivery company and we're in the age of delivery and you're going to see more and more companies deliver um, or growth and delivery 
of food and retail and, every, and or many, many tangible products. If you've got a health risk through a pandemic and we've got 2,700 stores delivering over nine markets at various states of that pandemic, potentially if it grew, we have to make sure that the interactions between our customers and our staff are as safe as possible. And we had to take a, what if you want to call it a punt or a, or, or, or a bit of a risk and start building those solutions as fast as possible, even before they were mandated and even before some countries even admitted that it was a risk. And you know, that, that made me a proud moment in the business because I just saw us, some companies would have held off and not wanted to spend, risk the capital or operational investment. And we were like, we have to do the right thing because if this accelerates, we need to be in a position that we know we've done the best to keep our staff and team members safe. Now that's great thinking, but then on the other hand, myself and my team had to deliver the solution. <laughs> Technically, you know, operationally, obviously we had our supply chain, they had their challenges and I can't talk too to that. We had operations deal with the, you know, um, with their, but we had to provide within a very short period of time, new service methods on our online platform, which is already over 70% of our sales. And also you can imagine a, a refined conversion rate. So introducing something very quickly around a pickup and a delivery service, which was zero touch. So you don't need to touch the customer, don't need to go in contact with the customer from a safety perspective. How do you do that? in rapid development when the pandemic's growing an exponential rate every day. So, you know, I know Mark's on the call, I think he was in that meeting, we sat down and the original forecast was we'll get something out in six weeks for the first market. And if it was six weeks, that would have been a totally different story for the business. I think from memory, it was five, six days, maybe a week. And we had that rolling out. Thanks to having a unified platform, we were just starting to roll it out in just over a week to every market. And that meant that we, as it escalated even fast, like every day people remember the news was changing or I would get off a phone call at seven, six o'clock on a Sunday night and wake up and something we, in other areas we built for France, we were utilizing in Netherlands because of something broken overnight. We challenged ourselves on what, are, what we really see as an MVP is and how fast we can get decisions through our network, which is usually very quick. Um, and it was even quicker. And then we learned from that when unfortunately, and I know Nick, you're in, you're in Melbourne and a lot of people are infected in Melbourne, from, impacted by Melbourne's um, lockdown. You know, then we put the same thought process and work with a partner to bring car park delivery to Melbourne at a rapid rate, well longer than we had planned in our calendar. And with the knowledge that we had and the experience over 13 years, and, and as I said, people can look at our side and say, why do you do that, why do you do that? We, we have our numbers. We could take a fairly calculated gamble on how to introduce the interface to activate because at first it was customer initiated zero touch because some markets it wasn't an issue yet and then it became mandatory but as it was customer initiated or mandatory how do we introduce it without losing percentages on our conversion and therefore a downstream of lost sales so we could do that with some confidence but then also we are so focused on refinement we could quickly tweak it to optimize if we saw any concern or even see if we could even lift conversion because people felt safer. So it was just about challenging ourselves, but having that depth of knowledge of our system, having this quick moving ability of a global platform so we could roll it out quickly and then optimize um, fast and even tidy up. Sometimes an MVP roll out of tech, you know, you, you still got other feature sets that you want to roll or tweaks at the back end, do those over the coming weeks, but have the real experience out there straight away. And hey, if the pandemic didn't happen, which we all wish it wouldn't, it didn't, we would have had two new service methods out there that other companies in our industry don't. But what we were is first to industry in pretty much, I think all markets and giving the customer and our team members something that kept them safe. That's great. Um, we're almost on time. Katrina, I'll throw it back to you. Um, if you want to sort of see if there's any questions from the audience. Yes, we do have some questions, actually some really cool ones. Um, Amanda is asking, Michael, how did you build the digital capability in order to do all these things because having instant awareness with your customers um people telling you this is impossible how did you make the impossible possible um and how do you build the capability is, is that what your team is that um external factors like how do you get there in the end um it's a good question i think you know i can't i can't underplay having you know fantastic support from um from a from our CEO Don, you know, and and also from our board and and from our our leadership team, 
Uh, you know, that, that goes a long way. And, and we all know either through our own experience or other peers sometimes, especially in the past during our digital journey, digital was sometimes just a sideboard that was just thrown in whatever department. But so, so if someone could say, we've got a digital expert and we'll, we'll solve the world. You know, there was a passion that this is, this is real for us. So always the backing of the business believing. And then also, you know, I think it's in Domino's DNA that just because it hasn't been done doesn't mean it's not possible. It just hasn't been approached in the right way. And for us, that is either having great people internally that can solve it or reaching out and collaborating with partners who are open to a challenge and open to, okay, we might fail the odd time, but there's nothing wrong with failure if your failure because of incompetence is, a, is, 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 a, is another discussion and that's more of HR and a, and, and a performance issue, but failure because you're trying to do something that will change the position of a business or, um, or you know, transform the lives of our franchisees because we'll grow sales or optimize their efficiencies. If, if, if we see an opportunity there, let's, let's take a swing because if we hit, it's fantastic. If we miss, well, let's miss and contain that miss through an MVP or a prototype or know when to fold. And yeah, I think that's hopefully it. Just just a willingness to know not every everything's going to stick. Sometimes the impossible won't be possible. The the predictive ordering solution, which we did with AWS and Mexico, some people can read the case studies online. You know, we had a very rudimentary solution first before we went to machine learning because we hadn't found the part or even our own headspace of how to make the machine learning solution work. But we kept it on the back burner and we hit it. We had a product called On Time Cooking well before a lot of retailers now have. Um, location service detection if opted in for to have a pizza hot and fresh when the customer's on the way to the store. So if they got caught up with the dog or family, they could still get to the store and we'd only start cooking when they entered what we call a cook zone. No one had done it by the time we did it, but we just wait, we had it for a while and then we found the right partner, actually ThoughtWorks a part of that, to deliver it. We finally got to a stage where we thought we could deliver a partner and let's produce it. So I think not just letting, not getting caught up that no one's done it, hopefully having a company that will back you that let's try to chase the impossible, but being disciplined enough to know if it's not right, let's park it and come back to it. That that and 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 if it, and if it fails, sometimes fail fails more. Hopefully that is uh, yeah, that's the best I can answer that. I love it. I, I know that Amanda's also based in Brisbane, Michael. So I think I might connect you both offline, mm -hmm. and and you can grab a coffee and share war stories because I think there's plenty of similarities in in the challenges you're both trying to solve. So. Um, I'll, facilitate, I'll facilitate that I'll find with an eye on, on time. Who is it? Yeah, no, I'd say anybody wants to connect with Michael, please do reach out to him on LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> first of all, Michael, thanks a lot for sharing and, and Nick for questioning. Um, keen to hear about vegan cheese. I'm still a skeptic uh, when it comes to vegan cheese, but I'm willing to be surprised. Um, <laughs> we'll organize you one. <laughs> sounds, sounds like a plan. I'll order one now, actually. I'm quite hungry after uh, listening and hearing about pizzas and how pizza is taking over the world. So uh, thanks a lot, Michael and Nick. Um, for everybody, we'll send out a survey link to each of you. Please provide us with as much feedback as you can so we can um, learn, improve, um, create more minimal, lovable products and meet uh, amazing speakers like Michael here. Um, I think we cannot uh, get ahead if we don't innovate. And I think the key is not failing. I think the key is experimenting. You don't fail, you just keep on learning. So how do we see everything as a learning opportunity uh, and have a growth mindset moving forward? So have a beautiful day to everybody. Um, please provide your feedback uh, in the survey link. And thanks again, Michael and Nick. Um, it was a pleasure. Thank you, Train. Thank you, Nick. Thank thanks you, for the